This presentation is part of a series of three videos. They can be viewed in any order. Their aim is to explore the foundations of using acupuncture based on palpatory findings, as well as discussion of common mistakes. This series is not about imparting technical information, such as the use of specific protocols and points, but rather to look at general guiding principles. This video is about the history of some of the more common findings and how they have historically changed. It illustrates that patients, findings, and treatments change over time, reflecting the pathologies and needs of each era. When we see that, we can move more easily let go of assuming universal truths or universal treatments, and that allows us greater freedom to explore what is really most suitable for the patient. One of the first findings most students of what is often called Kiko Matsumoto style learn is a ketsu. Ketsu means bad blood. The term suggests an accumulation of something that is not physiologically useful. It is not the same as stagnant blood, which for most TCM practitioners suggests the use of blood movers like Tao Ren and Hong Wang. Oketsu is a bit more like blood that is slow rather than stuck. Blood that is not operating in full physiological capacity, kind of like sluggish in both flow and action. You might think of Oketsu a bit like a bruise. The blood is pooling, slowing its flow, not exchanging much, but it is not congealed. Oketsu reflexes pressure pain on left stomach 2627 area and can extend towards the navel to below left kidney 16. By five phases, this area is supposed to reflect the liver. The explanation is that the liver pulls a lot of blood, like a sponge, or as we say in Chinese medicine, the liver stores the blood. If the blood is sluggish, the movement towards the place it pulls will be backed up. That would be the portal vein, which is fed by the superior mesenteric vein coming from the small intestine. So the blood flows into the liver from the left, and hence the backup can show on the left side. This finding might or might not be accompanied by liver findings, as in right side liver 14 or under the ribs. It is an independent finding, though it can be part of a liver pattern. One of the closely associated symptoms that show with long-term oketsu is right side occipital pain, which one tends to relate back to the liver also. Oketsu was noted as cl clinically significant in patients with TB and lung infections. Notice, not necessarily liver. This demonstrate what is meant by bad blood. When there is fever and infection, it affects the blood, making it sluggish, less effective, but not creating fibroids or tumors, merely sluggishness. The official treatment protocol for Oketsu is left liver 4, which you take about once on below the ankle bone and needle upwards, and left lung 5, taking slightly more laterally than, say, the TCM location, which takes it at the tendon, and needle down towards the fingers. Liver 4, Tongi Fong, that which confers authority on the center, is set by the Ling Shu to smooth out or harmonize the abdomen. Lung 5 is the measuring of the pond or of the marsh. One might suggest that by measuring the pond, or rather measuring the rhythm of its flow, one smooths the marsh out, making it a radiant pond. Oketsu is often the first finding students are taught. There are many reasons for this. Oketsu is a simple finding that does not involve many options, either in diagnosis or treatment. Left stomach 2627 indicates Oketsu, full stop. Unlike right stomach 2627, which can reflect immunity, digestion, pelvic shift, lungs, and the kidneys, 
Oketsu is reflected in stomach 26, 27 on the left, and that's all that area supposedly reflects. It also has a clear and simple protocol, left liver 4 and left lung 5, and on the back, perhaps left bladder 35. So it is easy to learn. No complications. In the mid-90s, Oketsu was king. We would say that 80% of patients had Oketsu, and it was usually actually true. It was an extremely common finding. It was easy to clear, and it also tended to carry with it other findings, meaning that when you cleared Oketsu, lots of other abdominal findings would clear without being addressed directly. When I say abdominal findings, I include the chest, the neck, and the back. In other words, any finding one uses as a reflex. When a needle combination clears not just the finding it is intended to clear by textbook association, but other findings that are not associated with those points normally, it suggests that the point combination is essential, that it is addressing a root pattern in the body. And the Oketsu treatment in the mid-90s tended to do that. This was the case in the mid-90s. This was also the period in which this style became solidified and systematized in the West, again contributing to why students tend to learn it first. Because it was prevalent, elementary, simple to address, and simple to teach, it became the first building block being taught. It gained tremendous prominence that is not really justified in today's clinical settings. But the convenience of it survived, and it can lead to people overemphasizing Oketsu. In the past 15 or even 20 years, I have not found Oketsu very commonly. Furthermore, when I do find Oketsu, I tend to treat other patterns that are deeper and that tend to res resolve Oketsu, suggesting that Oketsu is no longer as primary, as essential, as at the root as it once was. So the pattern that was once king has become a sideline, almost like a vintage carryover. Nice to know, but not just clinic, clinically prevalent or useful. Why is that? I will offer my answer after we review the other patterns through a historical perspective. But before we move to the next pattern, I will say that a few weeks ago, I had a patient who just had a knee replacement and post-surgery developed nausea, fatigue, lack of appetite, and a fever. A week after the surgery, he was taken to the ER and spent four days in the hospital. It was determined that there was no infection in the joint, which is good, but they could not find an explanation for all his symptoms. Once he was discharged, he came to me, and lo and behold, here was Oketsu. As I said, I rarely see Oketsu nowadays. This patient fitted the bill. He had a fever, and he also had an operation which creates internal bruising, a classic confirmation. He had also been constipated, which could have been from the pain meds as well as the nerve block. The accumulation of fecal matter in the intestines further contributes to infection and slowing down or piling up the blood. Constipation tends to show a bit more laterally, further to the right than the stomach meridian, more towards the spleen channel. So when he shows Oketsu, he's showing Oketsu, not constipation. Needling left liver 4 and left lung 5 did resolve the Oketsu as well as other findings. I did do more points, but the so-called big deal for him was clearly Oketsu. It was also a big deal for me, as it was perhaps the first time in 10 years I had used this as an essential treatment. The next morning, I got a text from his wife saying he was feeling so much better and the symptoms were resolved. So please understand that I'm not saying that Oketsu is totally irrelevant or useless because I can, it can be a miracle treatment for the right circumstances. I am saying the students are offered the Oketsu theory as being more primary, more essential than it actually is, mostly because it is a convenient way to start. And that at one point it tended to be more primary, more essential than it tends to be now.
The next big finding was the adrenal finding. In fact, adrenal was popular before Ketsu, but in the early 2000s, it reigned supreme. Originally, it was considered an adrenal shock treatment. One had experienced fear or shock, a trauma, and now it shows as pressure pain just below kidney 16. By the early 2000s, this was extended to long-term stress on the body, developing, depleting the adrenal. And that could be chronic pain, long-term illness, immune problems, anything that keeps pulling on the body's resources and is being unresolved. It ultimately puts pressure on the adrenals, on our survival mechanism. Why does it show just below kidney 16? Although the adrenal themselves are situated higher than the level of the navel, the kidneys can be assessed just outside the navel. Although the kidneys are unlikely to reach quite as medial as the side of the navel, the renal vein drains into the vena cava at this level and width. When we look at the Chinese model, we see another statement. The kidney channels goes from the perineal floor up the front of the spine, and then at L2, Ming Men, moves forward and down, infusing the kidneys and down to the bladder. Another branch starts at the navel, moving upwards to kidney 27 and the throat. In other words, although we're used to thinking of the kidney meridian moving up from kidney 11 all the way up to kidney 27, the Ling Shu tells us that the flow goes from kidney 16 down to kidney 11, and from kidney 16 up to kidney 27. In other words, kidney 16, Huang Shu, a transport point, is where the two branches of the kidney channel split, one going down to the pubic bone and one moving up to the chest. When one experiences fear or shock, the kidney channel associated with fear will experience the downwards movement of the fear and split the healthy connection between those two branches. The reason we see it below kidney 16 is precisely because fear is associated with sinking. When you have a nightmare or a conscious experience of impending shock or trauma, you can often feel yourself contracting into the navel. The original treatment for adrenals was kidney 6 with kidney 27. If one were trying to, as if one were trying to unify the kidney channel, kidney 27 is Shu Fu, the transport of the Fu, while kidney 16, which is the target to release, is Huang Shu, the Shu of what is missing, perhaps the umbilical cord. Kidney 6, Zhao Hai, reflect, shedding or reflecting light on the ocean. It sheds light by providing a separation action between the heel and the malleolus, provides the act for the activation of the inner thighs, which then supports the perineal floor and hence the whole abdomen and the spine. This is a bit complex and I have talked much about Shui as well as kidney six in the context of creating the support of the abdomen cavity and the upright posture elsewhere. Different practitioners have different ideas as to whether one must show below kidney 16 on both sides to qualify your adrenal or just one side. On the one hand, the adrenals work as a system, so both sides should be involved. On the other hand, it is possible that one adrenal is more affected and also that the connective tissue on one side is more affected even though the actual condition that initiated the change is not necessarily more severe. For me, the best way to assess that is to see if the adrenal treatment on the side of the unaffected kidney 16 affects other findings. This way, the adrenal treatment on the so-called good side is not measured against the dogma against below kidney 16, and it will reveal if that treatment is useful or more than just the textbook indication. If it is, then you know that you have the right idea. 
If you prescribe to the idea that adrenal can reflect only once, only on one side below kidney 16, there is still the question of whether one should treat both sides or just one side. There are variations in how to approach it. I happen to be of the opinion that you treat both sides because the side that seems like it is unaffected may not show pressure pain below kidney 16 simply due to the way that the connective tissue is aligned and not because the adrenal on that side is unaffected. I believe it is best to treat both sides. You might say that you are treating the side reflecting adrenal as treatment and the so-called non-reflecting side as insurance, just in case. By the late 2000s, the reflex be below kidney 16 was less common. We now move on the reflex fashion procession onto kidney 2. That reflex is still relatively common. Kidney 2, Rangu, the blazing valley, can also be interpreted as the blazing desires, because Gu, valley, can be a short for you, desire. When we are running after our desires, or we might phrase it as what burns inside us, we're running after what burns inside us, disturbing our sense of peace, we're constantly activating kidney two, just in front of the base of the heel, the space that shifts us forward so we can go and run, run after our desires. Kidney two starts to be overused and inflamed when we have many, many desires. This is also an adrenal pathology related to the constant creation of a sympathetic state of running after. The treatment here is also adrenal treatment, but rather than use kidney 6 with 27, we use kidney 7, kidney 10, and kidney 27. This is a standard use of metal and water points to overcome fire. Kidney 2 is the fire point on the kidney channel. Kidney 10 is the water point, and kidney 7 is the metal. Water overcomes fire, and metal, being the mother of water, reinforces this fire calming capacity. Another way to look at these points is that kidney 7 for you to recover the flow or repeat the skating. Kidney 7 is where one will feel a falling down sensation on the kidney channel, as if the tendons and muscles here are pushing down, sagging into kidney 7. It is a point that allows us to establish an upward action, an upward vector in the inner leg, part of the idea of establishing the twine, the ability to kick down in order to lift up and to counteract the pressure on kidney 2. That means that kidney 7, in order to be at the sagging point, might not be exactly two ton above the ankle bone. It might be at varying positions or distance relative to the Achilles tendon and relative to the malleolus. Kidney 10 is yin gu. If kidney 2, the roasted or the blazing valley, reflects the burning, the desires, then kidney 10 represents the ability to calm the valley, the gu, or the desires, the you, a more yin approach, so to speak, perhaps a place of refuge at the joint space behind the knee. The space behind the knee tends, bends, and it tends to allow us for movement, but the actual movement initiating what is happening um, behind the knee is actually elsewhere. Kidney 10 is kind of like the calm zone. By the early to mid to 2010s, two different patterns started to gain dominance. The first was a pulsing area of the navel. It is named Ren 9 pulse, but it can be felt anywhere above the navel as well as below, and usually to the left of the navel. Generally, it will tend to concentrate around the navel, but it can go as far up as REN12 and even REN14 on some people. On some people, the pulse is felt more clearly on left kidney 1516 than on REN9. 
Ren9 is just taken to represent the focal point of the pulsation. It's just a way to name it. Ren8, Shen Chui, is the guardian, guardian gate or the watchtower of the Shen. The other Chui watchtower in the body is Ren14, Jiu Chui, the giant watchtower. The feeling of the blood pulsing indicates two things. The first is the physical laxness of the abdominal tissue. The, the aorta is right in front of the spine. And if the mesenterian tissue is toned, the pulse will not be felt close to the skin on the front. Do not confuse the tone of the internal connective tissue with the tightness of the abdominal muscles. It is quite possible to see people with muscularly tight abdomens, but with a pulse showing. What muffles the pulse are not the muscles, but the internal fascia that surrounds the abdominal organs, especially the small intestine. Ren 9, Hui Fun, the dividing water, is associated with the small intestine. The small intestine is concentrated around the navel, and this is where it is closest to the surface. Further away from the navel, other organs will be in front of the small intestine. The fascia around the small intestine is the fascia we expect to be muffling the pulsing of the aorta. So if the pulse reaches the front, it suggests a weakness in that fascia surrounding the small intestine. So the first indication is a weakness of the lower dantian. The other indication is related to the shen, as expressed in the name for Ren 8, Shen Chui, and in that what you're feeling is blood pulsating. The blood being the residence of the shen or of the emotions. Pulsing around the navel can be an indication of frustrated emotions, which the heart cannot contain well and is now being spilled out showing in the blood vessels pulsing. The original treatment option was right side stomach 24. Stomach 24 is called Hua Yo Men, the slippery flesh gate. And what we have here is slippery flesh. The right side is considered the blood side, though I am aware that this is often looked upon with distrust by people who are trained to see the right side as yang and the left side as yin. This is a whole other discussion. In fairness, this treatment was never satisfactory. While it is true that one rarely, if ever, diminishes the pulsation to none with all the other treatment options also, the problem with right stomach 24 was not just that it did not eliminate the pulsing, but that it usually does not do much else either. It does not seem to affect much more beyond Ren 9. Because of the emotional heart connection, one can sometimes find a cardiac reflex, spleen 20, so wrong, on the left side, accompanying Ren 9 pulse. Zhou means a circuit or all around. It also means cautious or careful. The etymology of Zhou is how to use the mouth. Rong means lush, luxuriant, like the bright, the um, bright layers, the bright leaves of a tree. This suggests complete or full, or full circulation, as well as whether one expresses the heart or suppresses the heart. So it serves both the heart mentally and the heart physically by name. Gallbladder 26 releases the area of the pectoralis. So left gallbladder 26 was added to right stomach 24 as the treatment protocol for Ren 9 pulse. But again, this mostly fell short. In my experience, side gallbladder 27 or 28 does a far better job. Side gallbladder 27, 28 means take the level of Ren 4 and go all the way to the side. Look for the ropey sensation, the tight sensation in the gluteus medius. Gallbladder 27 is Wu Shu, the five pivots or the five hubs. Gallbladder 28 is Wei Dao, the way of linking, tying or supporting, as in Wei Mai. 
Both names suggest the support stabilization that is offered by the gluteomedius. Of course, the same idea of support can be assigned to the inguinal ligament and the psoas, where these points are described nowadays in current text. But the location on the glute medius is stronger for strengthening in the space of the abdominal cavity. The pulsing navel, or REN9 pulse, was a very common finding in the 2010s. Although it has lost some of its popularity by the middle of the decade, it is still a common pattern that should be addressed whenever it is found, which will be quite common. It won't be rare. Another pattern that gained popularity in the 2010s, meaning it showed more and more frequently in patients, is right stomach 2627. This is a somewhat more complex pattern as it can indicate a variety of diagnostic options. By five-phase theory, this area reflects the lungs. However, this will not always be true for people with lung issues, like bronchitis, which tends to reflect on the chest, on the kidney line, and between the scapulas, bladder 13 and bladder 42 area. In chronic and deep-seated lung issues, that is when it may show on right stomach 26, 27. This area also reflects digestion. It is the junction of the small and large intestines, the ileocecal valve. So it marks the end of absorption of, of digestate and the beginning of elimination. It will show in many lower gut conditions. And also, because it sits over the appendix, which is an immune organ, and much of our limbs are concentrated in the gut, Right stomach 2627 is also a reflection of immunity. Pressure pain here can reflect weak immunity. A pelvic shift can also reflect here, though this is really not very common. When you have checked the other options and none of them seem to resolve right stomach 2627, try pressing on the sacroiliac ligaments. Reach your fingers under the patient's buttocks and press on the sacroiliac ligaments. If that resolves the pressure pain on right stomach 26, 27, and nothing else did, it suggests that the problem reflected here is actually structural. Lastly, right stomach 26, 27 can reflect the state of the kidneys in the sense of the kidney's ability to regenerate, to move, move from full yin, that's water, to yang from within the yin, that is wood the capacity to not just store the essence, but to mobilize the essence out towards life. The digestion, immune, and kidney generative capacity are the most common reasons behind right stomach 26, 27 lighting up. And right stomach 26, 27 is possibly the most common finding one finds currently. The resolution will depend on which of these three options is the main cause, though it is entirely possible that all three are involved. For immune issues, use the so-called immune point between large intestine 10 and 11 on the edge of the bone. For digestive issues, you will likely find either spleen 9, stomach 41, or small intestine 3, or even small intestine 1 in combination with small intestine 2 to be the most common solution. Though, there are plenty of other options. And for kidney regenerative capacity, kidney 7 or kidney 9 are usually my best choice. It is interesting to note that right stomach 2627 was not a common finding in the 90s. And it was not for lack of trying to find it. Given it was the heyday of Aketsu on the left side, stomach 2627, naturally one always also checked the right side, if nothing else just for comparison. And yet it was not a prevalent finding. I attribute that to the fact that by the 2010s, our life got far more information and technology dependent, much more fast paced. We now had a lot more to digest. Another finding that is common now, but was not as common decades ago, is REN12, which also 
corresponds to digestion, as well as being the start engine, so to speak, being the place from which the meridians come from. That is the ability to take the essence and express it out. REN12 is also the meeting point of the flu, meaning it is the influential point of exchanging. The rise of REN12 as a common reflex was at about the same time as right, right stomach 26, 27, though if I recall correctly, maybe a little lagging behind. One finding that has been most consistent and very common throughout the last three decades is the SCM, reflecting the vagus nerve and hence the state of the autonomic nervous system, but also of the thyroid. So how do we inter interpret these changes in what I call the popularity of abdominal reflexes, the fashion, how the, these reflexes change from every few years or every decade? We can say that some of it has to do with the awareness of the practitioner. But let's face it, REN12 is an important landmark, and I always checked it. And right stomach 26, 27, being that it was opposite side of Oketsu, was also always checked. And neither showed up frequently. Different patterns have emerged and have faded over the years. Why is that? I believe it is because patients changed in accordance with our societal patterns. The 90s were a decade of great optimism. The wall had fallen, the Cold War was over, as were Thatcherism and Reaganism. The economy was booming with the dot-com industries and new startups and lots of creativity. I like to say it was an era where everybody was having a good time with a bit too much cheese, too much wine, as if compensating for the stark coldness of the 1980s. Why was Oketsu so prevalent then? When we indulge in too much cheese, too much wine, the metabolic waste products build up, and the result may have been Oketsu, a relative mild form of stagnation mild relative to the stasis we see in, say, tumors. The 90s were an era we took things for granted. So as a culture, on the whole, the presentation of health problems was on what we might term a so-called lighter plane. This is not to say that individuals did not suffer from very severe illnesses, but to suggest that the common finding reflected the spirit of the era. Alternatively, you could say that Oketsu was a buildup of the alienation of the 80s, the unsettling shift in the economy and social support structures, the threat of nuclear war, the decline of the environment, and the psychological scars of the AIDS crisis, an epidemic one assumed modern medicine should be able to eradicate, but didn't. Yes, it's possible that Oketsu was a late manifestation of the culture of the 80s, but I don't think that is the case. I wasn't treating patients in the 80s. I started palpating abdomens, necks, and backs in 1992. I do not have the experiential comparison necessary to make full assertions. But if Oketsu was a manifesta manifestation that came a decade behind the culture that formed it, then the next popular findings should follow a similar pattern reflecting conditions that took place years earlier. But that is not what I see. So while I am not familiar with the patterns that might have been common in the 1980s, I suspect that they possibly matched that era, even though I do not know what they were. And that Oketsu really did match the mid-90s. We then come to the beginning of the 21st century. It started with, with what was then anticipated as the great Y2K crisis, where computer systems were thought to malfunction due to the date change. And although it did not manifest, there was a large buying frenzy, primarily by corporations in 1999, in preparation for a potential disaster. The result was that the economy turned sour in 2000, because so much of the buying power was exercised the year before, there wasn't that much money left in budgets. At the end of 2000, America experienced a large shock. 
it had a president-elect who was not elected by the people. This all sounds quite familiar, doesn't it? But this was 2000. George Bush did not receive the majority of the votes of the people, and his electoral college win was decided by the courts, not the people. This is important because one of the basic pillars of the American understanding of life is that America is and exemplifies democracy. You might say that this is a myth, but it is a myth that is very deeply rooted in the American psyche. Another strong assumption is that America is prosperous. That myth was not totally shattered in 2000, but it was weakened. Then, on September 11, 2001, America was attacked for the first time on its own soil. Americans have never experienced a war on American soil, not a foreign one. And now the third basic myth has been eroded, the belief in the strength and safety of America. In the first years, two years of the 2000s, the three most basic assumptions that constitute the definition and safety net of Americans has been shattered. It is easy to see how adrenal shock came onto the stage as the predominant finding in patients' abdomens following these changes in our collective consciousness. The economy then grew and then collapsed in 2008. We got accustomed to the horrors of things like Guantanamo as simply being out there. We started to feel less in control of life and became better consumers of things like yoga, laptops, granite top counters, whatever. We used consumption to cope with a world we no longer felt we understood or, more importantly, controlled. It was a perfect combination of our desires manifesting as both spiritual and material materialism, and a world demanding ever faster stimulation through the use of computers. The result in patients was kidney tooth showing, reflecting the burning desires, constantly moving forward too fast. As the decade turned, the Great Recession was starting to turn around, but we have lost a certain kind of trust in the system, in the world. For decades, we had known that the environment was being destroyed. It had different expressions already in the 70s, where the talk was about big oil and pollution and not yet about rainforests. We have spoken about ozone holes and global warming and not so much about the terms we use now like climate change or climate crisis. But the seeds of knowing we were living in a collapsing world, that we're living on borrowed time, had already been there for five decades. What was also there all along was the sense that something must be done and the system is screwed up because it is not addressing these problems. So over time, we're getting an ever stronger sense of disconnect between who we are as individuals and the systems that are meant to serve humans and the planet be it companies, the government, the educational system, the economic system, etc. Along this disconnect, this distrust of our systems, we were also experiencing a loss of personal empowerment through the further application of computers. We had entered the beginning of the robotic age. We were no longer able to talk to a person on the phone, not unless you were screened and identified electronically and then went through many menus to narrow down your option. Press 1 for this, and press 7 for this, etc., etc. We started to get used to having no power if the computer screen was not set up to see the logic of what we were trying to do. Software was now dictating both the problem and solution. If it wasn't in the software, it basically did not exist. The sense of no control has come along with the Ren 9 pulse. A sense of lack of ground, the lower Dam Tian is weakened. It has slowly started to penetrate deeper and is becoming a little bit like what was once termed learned helplessness. One simply gives up. 
as that starts to seep in, right stomach 26, 27 gains popularity. Why is that? For one thing, because we're losing our capacity to act, to generate, to mobilize our kidneys. That is what learned helplessness is. I see no reason to mobilize my resources when the cards are all stacked against me. It is the sense that nothing that I do matters. There is no future. It also means that we are in constant struggle with our environment, which is rapidly changing, demanding constant adjustments on our part. This matches up with the immune reflection of right stomach 26, 27. The struggle of me with my immune system against the environment. And we're finding it more and more difficult to digest this rapidly changing and perhaps devolving world, reflecting as right stomach 26, 27 being a digestive reflex. So we're seeing a progression of ill being that corresponds to our societal challenges. Throughout it all, what has been an underlying consistent finding, the SCM, has been the challenge on our nervous system. Again, reflecting on the SCM. I know that you might be thinking, this guy is a political heretic. I am the product of the circumstances of my life, some of which are shared in our collective consciousness and some are unique to me. My point is not to convince you of my social political analysis, which is likely not very sophisticated. After all, I'm an acupuncturist. I'm not a political scientist. As an acupuncturist, my point is that the body, medicine, and medical conditions are changing and evolving. Not to create theories and dogmas, though those can be fun to contemplate and debate, but to facilitate our understanding, to make us more flexible, to make us respond better, as we are once again in the throes of a big change. The ones we cannot even name as just COVID, or just social unrest, or divisiveness, or any one thing. We simply call it 2020. It also brings up this way of looking at the changing of abdominal findings so it becomes a preamble to my admonition that the abdomen is not king. That is the subject of another video in the series, suggesting that we should not be slaves to the abdominal findings, but use them intelligently. We can say that a common thread throughout the different aspects of the 2020 challenges is the aspect of unpredictability, the aspect of not knowing. Our generation never expected a disease that we would succumb to in a way that we did this year. We had relegated epidemics to eras past, or perhaps thought that they were still surviving in the swamps of Africa, say. But of course, the swamps of Africa are in fact part of our world and we somehow relegated them to another world. Also, in our so-called modern world, we never imagined nor built up the skills to cope with the challenges to democracy we have been facing. What we found when we faced these challenges unprepared is that we have little capacity to be with not knowing, not controlling, not understanding. We found arguments erupting with little data, contradicting data, but the arguments have been extremely strong and spirited. We have all wanted to predict, to get a sense of knowing, to get a sense of control. It suggests that we may start to see more disorders in the ability to assimilate and digest the world and be comfortable in the world. In other words, more digestive issues digestion, adrenals, and the nervous system are likely to be reigning supreme. They have been for the past 10 years or so, or even 20 already. The shift, I suspect, will be a further increase in digestive issues as the manifestation. I believe we will start seeing different patterns emerging, and they will likely show in the abdomen too. I'm not sure what they will be, but I believe that we will start seeing shifts. I suspect 
but kidney too, representing our burning desires, and Ren 9, representing weakness and a sense of grounding or trust, and right stomach 26, 27, and Ren 12, representing our inability to digest the ever-changing world, our sense of despair and inability to move forward or out, and our sense of being on the defense against a non-hospitable environment. These all will probably stay, but more might be added. Can I anticipate the next popular reflexes, the trends that 2020 will bring to us? Not really. Looking at the general trends over the past 30 years, I suspect we may find one of two trends or both. And these are not specific um, reflexes. Um, I'm not mapping the abdomen here, but just a general idea. Either a lot more patients with many more abdominal reflexes, far more than are common now, will be the case, or abdomens that show nothing, sort of an empty slate, will be very common. And both of these can come together, not in the same patient, but they can be at this, you know, they can be common in an era. This is not talking about muscle tone. Although I do expect that we may see two patterns showing up with tonicity. A lot more people with very highly tight abdomen, as well as lots of people with very flaccid abdomens. But both the tight and the flaccid types can still display lots of abdominal findings or no findings. So I believe that we will get to, you know, a lot more patients with lots and lots of findings, which will get very confusing or lots and lots of patients with no findings at all, which is also confusing because now we have nothing to confirm our diagnose with. And why is that? As our collective tends to become more and more engaged with the brain and technology, the connection between the brain and the body is being weakened. That suggests that the fascia will get a different set of signals, perhaps less signals, and we, as we adjust to the information age, which is likely only just beginning, the overload can result in some disconnect. The abdomen can either start to generate its own signals in order to create or compensate for what was before its normal feedback, or it can just not participate in those signals due to confusing signals or lack of signals from the brain. Therefore, either the very busy and confusing abdomen with lots of findings, or a tell-nothing kind of abdomen. Both of those opposite types are quite common in patients with long-term chronic debilitating diseases already. The neck, being the bridge between the brain and the body, is likely to continue being significant as that connection gets eroded. The area I feel a bit more clarity about is our choices of treatment points. Already over the past seven or so years, I have been seeing a rise in interest in skull points. I see myself using more skull points as well as other people. I see a great deal of interest in different skull systems, be it Jew, Yamamoto, or even what are called facial treatments. It seems to me that the line between stomach eight and do 24 will likely become our next go-to treatment area, say like stomach 36 has been used or large intestine 4 by TCM. There are several reasons for that. First, just about all scalp acupuncture systems seem to emphasize this area as the primary target. This suggests that this area has a strong effect on the body, more so than other areas of the skull. I do not know this for certain, but if people with extensive experience with scalp and who are experimenting with the scalp all day on multitudes of patients keep coming back to give preference to this area, it suggests that they are finding it highly effective, more so than other areas. As we become more cerebral as a society with the advent of technology, we will likely become more and more brain-oriented and less and less body-oriented. 
At some point, technology will also start to be incorporated into our bodies, not as titanium joint implants, but as computer chips making biological functions and decisions to replace damaged functions of organic tissue. There is already talk of implanting nano 3D printers for regenerating tissue. Though the discussion is currently with regards to musculoskeletal system, it will likely move towards organic functions as well. This will probably take years, maybe even decades, but the trend is already here, though it is in its infancy, and it suggests that the brain will become the strongest area from which to affect the body. When we look at the hairline, we do see that the ancients chose to look at it as an area that influences the Shen, the animation, with points like Du 24, Shen Ping, the courtyard of the Shen, or Gobara 13, the root of the Shen, Ben Shen. When we look at the stomach meridian, its first channel starts at the eyes, goes down to the nose, circles the mouth, goes through the jaw, then the ear, up to stomach 8, and then enters the brain at Du 24. The stomach channel that goes down the body starts at the Great Welcome, Da Ying, stomach 5, and then moves down the SCM into the chest abdomen, somewhat similar to the vagus nerve. That first branch, the one that ends at Du 24, represents the role of the stomach, what is meant to digest. We take all the input from all the sense organs, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the tongue, the ears, and move it all into the brain to be assimilated. This is that line of Du 24 to stomach 8, the frontal hairline that it goes to. And that is why I think this line of stomach 8 to Du 24 will become more and more influential as we keep being challenged in our ability to assimilate, to understand, or to control our world. Of course, no one can predict how the human organism will evolve. What we can do is to keep in mind that we are evolving. This is very clear as I look at just the 30 years of my own experience in observing, palpating, and treating patients. How much more so when we look at the span of the past 2,000 years of Chinese medicine? Basic principles formulated in the Shan Han Lun can still be applied in today's world. But we modify the ideas and we modify the treatment strategies in accordance with, with what we see in our patients. Similarly, we keep changing with our own lifetimes, within our own lifetimes. We keep observing and working out the best way to address the issues of the times. I started talking, out, talking about Oketsu and its so-called decline. Throughout the years, I've had students who insisted on trying to find and treat Oketsu no matter what. After all, it is touted as the most prevalent, the most important finding. Even if I did not find Oketsu, sometimes they did. Perhaps they were pressing stronger on left stomach 26, 27 than anywhere else because they were expecting or wanting it to show. And even if when I would show them better strategies to treat the patient, they would keep wanting to fall back on liver 4 and lung 5. We are creatures of habit. Sometimes our habits can prevent us from offering the best of ourselves to the patients. We are likely facing another shift in disease and its presentation. Being aware of that allows us to observe more diligently and let go of preconceived ideas to be open to what might manifest. Being flexible and emphasizing what we observe over our habits can be the key to clinical success.